Hi, I am Mohammad Sadri, a member of Microelectronics System Design Research Group at TU Kaiserslautern. And this is one of our videos regarding the Zinc device and designing embedded systems using Xilinx Zinc. In this video, I want to briefly show you some of the available developed evaluation or educational boards for the Xilinx Zinc. And for now, for the first video, I want to talk about the most important concepts of the boards. So I will go and show you two boards practically in this video. The first one is the Z board which you can find in the zboard.org website and is mainly developed by Avnet. This board contains one Zinc 7020 device, so the part number would be XC7Z020-1. And I described to you what minus one means in the previous video. It means, in fact, in the a series of 7020 zinc devices, the minus one is the slowest one. And at the same time, it is the cheapest one, the most economical one. And the chip that they have used in the Z board contains 484 pins. Now, this board, if you want to purchase, will cost you around $400 if you can find it available in the market. And if I look at the Xilinx uh, 7020 device, I can see that the programmable logic of, the, of this specific Zinc device contains 85 kilo logic cells and something near 560 kilobytes of block memory and total 220 DSP slices, which are capable of performing uh, multiplication, single cycle multiplications of 18 by 25 bits uh, for you. Now, I put this board, in fact, in front of the next board that I want to show you, and is the ZC706 board which contains one Zinc 7045 device. So the part number will be XC7Z045-2. And it contains 900 pins, so they have used the package with 900 pins. And as I showed you before, the Dash 2 device will be generally faster than the Dash 1 device. Uh, meaning that the logic that you implement here would run at higher clock frequency. Obviously, this board comes at a very high price. It's something near $2,800 in the market. And as of our experience, there, there, there are a lot of requests on this board currently because it's really handy and useful for different kinds of projects. And if I look at the PL of this device, I can see that the PL contains 350 kilo of logic cells and something near 2.1 megabytes of block memory and 900 DSP slices. In this video, I only will focus on the DRAM memory installed on these two boards. Let's first have a very brief look also at the boards. So for the Z board, I show the board to you here. OK, so I have the Z board here with myself. and. I will ha I, we will show you a close-up of each of the, Z, uh, of the Z board and also the ZC706 board. And 
Now I want to very briefly show you, in fact, the different interfaces and components that we have on the Z board. Obviously, on the center, we have the zinc device uh, with a heat sink installed on the zinc device. And then here, uh, we have two components. In fact, they are DRAM components. And then we have a set of, in fact, general purpose interfaces, a general purpose IOs, uh, that when, for example, you are bringing up the Android operating system on the board, you can use them as a kind of mouse, the, the, the push buttons here that you have, you can use them as general purpose IO, and also the deep switches that you have here, they can also be used as general purpose IO. You have a small LCD or I would say OLED display here. It's very small and I like to say it's practically not really usable. It's a good feature, but it's very small. Then on the other side of the board, you have a set of interfaces that you completely know. You have the, the gigabit Ethernet interface, the HDMI interface, and I think the VGA interface. Then you have the audio input outputs, which are practically connected to an audio codec on the board. And then uh, you have the plug for the power, uh, which is located here, the plug for the power. And then most importantly, you have the USB interface through which you can program the board. So you have this USB interface here, which will be used for programming the board. And this is something we will talk about extensively because it is extremely important. And then there are a set of other USB interfaces here. One of them can be used as a kind of general purpose, I would say, USB interface. I mean, for the application that you want, you can use it. But the other is usually used as the UART interface. So in the basic configuration that you turn on the Z board, you have your power connected here. You have the programming cable connected here. And then you have your UART cable. OK. Then for the A2Ds of the Z board, uh, we have this connector here, which is connected, in fact, to the ADCs inside the Z board, the, the zinc component, and it can be used. And whenever you want to extend the functionality of the board. For example, you have a set of high speed ADCs and DACs and you want to connect them to the Z board. Or you have an additional card, additional extension card and you want to connect it to the Z board. Or you have a camera and you want to somehow connect the camera to the Z board. Then you have this FMC interface and your extension card can be plugged into this FMC interface, which provides, I think, more than 60 IOs. And these IOs go to the Zinc device, and they can be used uh, for transferring data between your card and the Zinc device. Finally, we have this important uh, SD card interface here on which you can put your SD card. The SD card can contain all of the resources for bringing up your Zinc device. So the Zinc device can be booted uh, using many different techniques. Either we can use the JTAG programming interface here to transfer the PT stream, the executables for the ARM host, and 
the configuration data to the Zinc device. Or all of this information can be copied to, a, to an SD card, and the SD card can be installed here. And the Zinc device reads the SD card at boot time. Or all of the information can be stored here on the flash memory, which is installed on the board. And then at power on, the Zinc device can read the flash memory and get booted based on the content copied to the flash memory. On the other hand, here we have the ZC700 6 board. This is a big board. I will briefly describe each part. Here on the center, of course, we have the Zinc device, and here we have a fan installed on the Zinc device. Maybe the device can get very hot. And then you have two sets of DRAM modules. One set is here under this cover, and this is the DRAM module, which will be driven by the PL part of the Zinc device. And the next set of DRAM components are here. As you see, they are here. And these are the DRAM components which are connected to the PS of the Zinc device. Then you have the programming interface. So the same concept of having the JTAG chain and all of the devices inside the JTAG chain and using the JTAG chain to configure the hardware and to use it. You have also the concept here. And in fact, the JTAG uh, interface, the USB interface for the JTAG is provided on this side of the board. So you have here, indeed, uh, two USB connectors. And one will be mostly used for UART, and the other will mostly be used for the JTAG interface. Then you have the Ethernet connector and HDMI connector. Also a set of LEDs. And the LEDs are mostly useful when you install the card as an extension card inside your PCI Express slot. The point is, on this board, we have the PCI Express interface available, and the board can be plugged into a computer and can be operated as one of the extension boards inside the computer. So you have a 4x PCI Express interface here, which are practically connected to high-speed serial transceivers inside the Zinc device. And then there exists complete design that you can use to operate the board over the PCI Express interface and to transfer data between the board and the rest of the system in a normal computer. Regarding extension cards, as you saw, on the Z board, there exists one FMC interface. However, on this board, there, there are two. So on this board, you have higher number of pins available for your extension card. And as a result, you, have, you can have higher bandwidth, higher data transfer bandwidth. Then on this side, you have the SD card. Exactly the same concept as, as the 7020 device, as the Z board, no difference. Then Again, the same as the Z-board, you have flash memories. And the whole system can be booted over the flash memory, over the SD card, or over the JTAG interface. Then you have the power interface here. And even when you install the board inside the PCI Express component, you need to get this power interface connected. It needs to be there. And then you have this blue deep switch here, 
which is indicative of the, of the boot mode of the Zinc device. So through these deep switches, you indicate how the device is going to be booted at power on. So either it should wait for JTAG, or it should go to the flash memory, or it should read the SD card. What kind of operation it should do at power on, they are all indicated using this deep switch board. So, if I want to look at the DRAM memory installed on these boards, I can see that for the Z board, we have total amount of 512 megabytes of DDR3 memory. And this DDR3 memory is actually connected to the programmable system part of the Zinc device. And if I had the ZC702 board of Xilinx, uh, we would have seen that that board contains one gigabytes of DDR3 memory, again connected totally to the PS of the Zinc device. And actually, if you look at the Zinc device, the maximum amount of DRAM memory that you can really connect to the PS is this one gigabytes memory. On the other hand, if I look at the ZC706 board, I can see that there exist two completely separated modules of DDR3 memory. One set is connected to the PS of the Zinc device, and another set is connected to the PL. So in total, you will have two gigabytes of DRAM memory on the board. Now, let's have a look at what do I mean by the DRAM memory is connected to the PS and what do I mean by the DRAM memory is connected to the PL. So here we have the block diagram, the simplified block diagram of the Xilinx Zinc device as described in the previous video. It contains two parts, one programmable logic and then the programmable system. And the programmable system, as described, contains a set of hard IP cores, like the ARM subsystem, the cache controllers, the DMA engine, a set of peripherals like the USB network, SBI, and so on, and a set of interconnects. Now, if we look at the DRAM controller component inside the PS, when I say we have, for example, 512 megabytes of memory on the PS, it means that this memory is connected to the DRAM controller of the PS. Now, what is the case for ZC706? Again, we have the Zinc device. The same structure as before, the PS contains DRAM memory controller, and to this DRAM memory controller, it is connected one gigabyte of memory. And then we, we can, in fact, instantiate another instance of DRAM controller directly on the PL. And to this instance of DRAM controller, we can connect one additional one gigabytes of memory. So for ZC700X, you can run the memory interface generator core of Xilinx. It is very famous, the MIG core. And you can go through the wizard and easily you can in generate a DRAM controller, which can be implemented on the PL part of the Zinc device and will talk to the one gigabyte DRAM DDR3 module installed on the ZC700X board. Now, I want to notify a very important point about the possible bandwidths that you can gain out of these DRAM interfaces. As of the default configuration 
of the zinc device, in fact, the zinc PS, the DRAM controller will operate your DRAM memories at 533 MHz. So the DDR3 DRAM controllers will operate at this clock frequency. And if we do a simple math, we can see that the total bandwidth that is achievable theoretically for this DRAM interface is 4.2 gigabytes per second. So, the entire bandwidth available for the ARM subsystem, for the peripherals, and also for the logic located on the PL part of the zinc, which want to use this DRAM memory, is 4.2 gigabytes. And this total bandwidth should be shared by all of these components. On the other hand, if we look at the DRAM controller located on the PL, we can see the possibility of having bandwidths higher than 4.2 gigabytes per second. So whenever your accelerators or the hardware that you have created on the PL part of the zinc wants to share data with the ARM subsystem, the best location inside the system that this data can be shared is on the DRAM memories of the PS. So the ARM CPU cores will store the data on the DRAM memories of the PS, and then the hardware accelerators or the components that you have created on the PL will talk to the DRAM connected to the PS to, to receive this data. Here in this figure, we have these components here that are in fact Axoi masters and are connected to this set of Axoi slave ports. And these are our accelerators. These are the, ha these are the hardware that you develop, in fact, to help the CPU in its operation. So what happens is that the CPU will store the data here on the DRAM and then these hardware components here through these Axoi interfaces will try to access the DRAM. While if you have an application in which there is no data sharing between the CPU and the hardware accelerators on the PL, the hardware accelerators can talk directly to the dedicated DRAM memory which is connected to the PL, which provides us a very good processing power and very good bandwidth. On these boards that I showed you, you can run a set of operating systems. You can run bare metal operating system. What does bare metal mean? It means practically you are running just the application that you want. Practically there is no concurrency between several applications. There is no uh, complicated, for example, TCP IP stack. You have a specific task and for that specific task you develop a specific application. It contains one main routine and the main calls a set of functions, one after another. And you create a, an executable out of this code and you run it on the ARM CPU cores. So the bare metal is the simplest option. And sometimes it is efficient because you are sure that the CPU cores are exactly doing what you want. They are not wasting their power or they are not consuming any processing power for other tasks. However, bare metal has serious limitations. On the ARM subsystem here, you can run the Linux operating system. Linux is completely supported. It's completely free. And everything related to Linux, also the root file system and drivers, they are all completely free available from Xilinx. 
that we will show in the in the in the future videos how you can use them and how you can compile your own Linux kernel and we will practically show you how we can create our own kernel level Linux drivers <coughs> so you have the complete support for Linux and as you install Linux you have the TCP IP stack you have the required code to handle the USB interfaces you have the required code to read, write, and handle the flash memories. So by just running Linux on your ARM subsystem, you gain a lot of possibilities, which are very difficult to obtain in the bare metal mode. As we will go through these uh, videos, we mostly use the Linux operating system running on ARM CPU cores to show the concepts of designing embedded systems, we think. Then there is the possibility of running the Android operating system on the top of the Linux. <coughs> of course, when you want to run the Android operating system, there is the need for a speci specific hardware components being instantiated inside the PL part of the Zinc. For example, Android needs a really good, or I would say, 3D supporting GPU instantiated on the PL part of the Zinc. And this component doesn't come for free. While you can download the source code, uh, you can download the complete Android from the Google servers, the hardware components that you need to bring up the Android on the Zinc device, they are not free. In fact, the beta streams are available for free, but usually the users want to have their own customizations, so you, should need, you need to buy, in fact, the GPU source code and to use that for bringing up a complete Android system on the Zinc device. And finally, there is also the possibility of running Windows Embedded on this device <coughs> because practically they are ARM and on the ARM platform you can run all of these operating systems. But the use of Windows Embedded as far as I know is very very limited and I know just one company is providing a board support package for Windows Embedded on the Xilinx Zinc device and actually that should be purchased. It's not freely available. So, <clears throat> there are a large number of peripherals on each of the boards that I showed you. Most specifically, there's the interface for Gigabit Ethernet. There are USB interfaces. As noted in the documents and also mentioned in advertisements the zinc device provides you also with analog to digital converter components that allows you to perform very simple analog to digital conversion tasks of course with a very of course with a low sampling rate then there are spi interfaces uart interfaces and as i will show you in the next videos, the Zinc device can also be used in configurations in which you have video inputs and video outputs. These we will cover in our future videos. Once more, I am Mohammad Sadri uh, from Microelectronics Systems Design Research Group, TU Kaiserslautern. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye.